Oh, hey. What's going on, everybody? This is Tedro. Welcome back to another installment of our music theory series. Now, this is part three so far of our music theory series, and we're going to be building on all the concepts we learned in the past two videos. If you missed the past two videos or you're feeling a little bit shaky on the concepts, I do recommend you go watch those before diving in here. The links are in the description. And I'll remind you that the whole purpose and the whole concept of this series is to get you learning some basic music theory in a practical way, a way that you can actually start implementing in creating your own music, your own music production. This video is going to be brought to you by Skillshare, which I have a new watercolor painting to show off to you all. And I just want to remind you all that uh, supporting the sponsor does support the channel. So keep an eye out for that. We'll talk about that later. And before we get into today's lesson, I want all your feedback. I want to see some comments about what you want the next installment to be about. I think that there's two routes we could go in next month's video. One of the options I think would be good to cover would be rhythm, constructing rhythms, kind of dissecting how rhythm works. The second option that I think would be interesting to dive into would be ear training. So I actually use my ears a lot in creating music. Obviously that sounded kind of dumb. What I mean is using my ears to clearly identify harmonies or certain melodies or being able to hear something and play it back on a keyboard, you know, that sort of thing and how to get there in your playing. If that option is appealing to you, let me know. So two options, comment which one you think is best, rhythm or your training for the next installment. And also while you're down there, let me know some of the things you've been learning from the series and that you've been implementing in your own music production. But all right, let's lay out what we're going to be talking about today. We have already learned about how to form a major scale and thus how to find a minor scale using the secret formula, whole, whole, half, whole, 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 half, which means you can start on any key, use that information. Let's say we start on A. We use that information to build a major scale. And you can do that on any key now using that secret formula. In part two, we learned how to build chords. So building off of that formula, taking the key of A and forming those triad chords. all the way up the scale. And today I want to do two things. I want to teach you a little bit more about chords and ways you can make them slightly more advanced. And in the second half of today's video, I'm going to show you how all of the knowledge that we've learned so far can be directly applied to making a track in Ableton Live. Should be a breeze, should be a good one. And again, I can't stress this enough. If some of that recap that I just talked about seemed confusing or you feel like you missed something, please go back and watch the previous videos. But if we're all good to move on, Let's get started. All right, so as I touched on in the previous video, we know how to make chords in any key. For now, just pick a key. We'll pick the key of D. Those are all the notes we're allowed to use. D, E, F sharp, G, A, B, C sharp, D. D again on top. So we can form triads by evenly spacing our fingers finding the root, the third, and the fifth of each chord. We talked about this last time. And remembering that we are locked into those specific notes. So when I get to this E chord, we know that it has to be E minor because of this minor third here. It can't be E major because G sharp is not in the key of D major. So it must be E minor. So we have D major, E minor, F sharp minor, because of course, F sharp in the key of D. G major, A major, B minor, C sharp diminished. Forget about that, we're not talking about that today. And D major. So we know all that. And those are the most basic forms of chords, triads, three notes, hence the tri. But there's a couple things we can do with chords to make them slightly more advanced. Now. I'm going to go down an octave here. Here's our usual D chord, D, F sharp, A. We are going to say that this chord is in root position. We call it root position because it's a D major chord and D is in the root. Now, chords can actually be rearranged to be in a different order, but they're still the same chord, right? So if this chord includes the notes D, F sharp, and A, I can play this in a different order and instead play A, D, F sharp. We're just taking that top note and putting it on the bottom. Even though this chord has the notes in a different order, it's still D 
major. It's just inverted. Now we can take this uh, one step further. We can rearrange the notes even more, right? So now let's take this F sharp and put it on the bottom. Regardless, we're still hearing the harmony of a D major, no matter how we play it. And don't forget that in most music, multiple parts of a track are working together to make a harmony, so there would likely be a bass line on the bottom. So even if one instrument was playing this collection of notes, you might have a bass playing a D in the bottom, which more clearly solidifies that harmony there as D major. I bring this up because a lot of the music that you hear, the chords are just not in root position. You rarely hear a song that goes like this. You might hear that chord progression all the time, but you might also say that the sound of that is a little bit childish and a little bit simple. What can actually make your chord progression sound slightly more advanced without adding any extensions, which we'll talk about in a minute, is using these inversions to more easily connect these different chords. So remember, we number these chords with Roman numerals, capital Roman numeral for a major chord, lowercase Roman numeral for a minor chord. The one chord here being D, five being A, six being B minor, and four being G major. Like I said, not playing those inverted sounds a little bit just simple. So let's use inversions to make it sound a bit better. So if I know that I'm gonna play D to A, well, what I just showed you is that we can actually invert this D chord to have an A as the lowest note. And what this does, if I play it with one hand, this actually makes it a lot easier to play because if I know I'm gonna go from D to A, all I had to do was move those top notes. And because those chords share a note, it actually makes it sound a lot smoother instead of even so if we now go from D in the inversion a in root position let's climb up to a B in root position and now we can even do another inversion of G because we see that we already have a B which is included in our G chord and we have one note on top that's very close to G so going from B minor to a G is that easy. Now, like I said before, uh, the harmony will be implied, but the more we kind of drift away from root position with these inversions, maybe the harder it would be for the listener to identify it as a G chord. It is very much still identifiable, but it will definitely benefit from a bass note. And we'll talk about that later when we talk about putting all of these ideas together in a track. But you can see how using inversions can actually not only make it easier to play, but make your chord progressions sound a lot smoother. So I highly recommend you start playing with inversions because not only will it make it sound smoother, it might also convey a specific mood or harmony different from playing the chords in root position. For instance, if I want to do a four, five, six progression, having that fifth on top is definitely one characteristic. You know, I'm playing those chords in root position, but inverting it and putting the fifth on bottom just has a different sound to it. Slightly moodier, maybe a little darker. Just another reason you might consider using chord inversions, but I think the main lesson to take away there is when you have the three notes of a chord, like D major, you rearrange those notes in any order, they're still D major. That's the first thing I want to show you about chords. The second thing I want to show you is that we can actually play notes beyond just the root, the third, and the fifth. Now we are indeed going to be staying in our key. Remember, we're always going to be staying in our key for the purposes of this lesson. So the only notes we have available to us are the notes in D major. Don't forget that. So if I play a D major triad, D, F sharp, A, we know we have root three, five. You've probably heard of seventh chords. We're still evenly stacking notes, essentially, but listen to that sound. You've probably recognized the sound even. 
That right there is a major seventh chord. Why is it called a seventh chord? Think back again to these numbers. One, three, five. Remember, we're skipping numbers. Seven. That's the seventh note of the scale. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And the distance between these two notes, the D and the C sharp, that interval is a seventh, a major seventh. Now this can be done for all chords and we can actually continue it on to nine and 11, even though that sounds a little confusing because there's really only seven notes in a scale, right? But if we just keep ascending and we just keep counting up and forget that the scale resets, we call it nine and 11. So we have one, three, five, seven. Now, if the scale continued, we'd have one, two, three, four, five, right? But instead we have eight, nine. Ten, eleven, which would be on G. I would say that all sounds good with that nine on top too. So that's where you might hear things like nine and elevens come in, seven, nines, and elevens. Uh, those are just notes that we continue to stack up on our chords. And remember that the nine and eleven comes from the idea that the scale would, instead of resetting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, we would continue counting eight, nine, ten, eleven. And there's all sorts of things like flat nine, sharp 11, things like that. We're not going to get into that today. Let's just speak diatonically, AKA in key, in our current key. Now, before we move on from the extensions with the chords, cause we're just doing this on our one chord, right? And we have that nice major seventh there. However, if I switch to the sixth chord, the B minor, and I continue stacking evenly. This is also a seventh chord. You can tell because I'm using four notes evenly spaced, but it's not a major seventh chord. We're just gonna call it a seventh. We don't call it a major seventh because a major seventh implies that that seventh note is a half step away um, from the root note of the chord. It would have to be this, which is not currently in our key of D major. So instead we have that, which gives a slightly different harmony than the uh, major seventh. But nonetheless is still a seventh. And on different chords, these sevenths will work better. How it sounds on the five chord, that sounds quite conventional, but adding a seventh on the four, I think is quite beautiful. Adding one on the sixth, also beautiful. Adding one on the one chord, very nice. So I just want you to be aware that even though our basic triad of one, three, five uh, is a good starting point, we can continue to stack on and create more advanced harmony with our chords. Not only that, we can use inversions to create better transitions or just convey a different mood. For instance, maybe you don't want that seventh on top. Having those two notes next to each other sounds kind of bad. Having it on the bottom sounds kind of bad, but spreading the notes out like this with the root, the fifth, the seventh, and the third on top doesn't sound so bad after all. And I'm just saying this in the moment, uh, but you can make your decisions based on your composition and what chord inversion sounds the best in the moment. This is just another thing to add to your arsenal. I don't want you to stress it too much, but if you're writing chord progressions and you're getting frustrated that it sounds a little bit basic, do one of two things. Consider adding an extension to your chords, like a seven or even a nine, or consider inverting your chords. or both. One more step for you just to bring that vision of what your song sounds like in your head to life and to also start hearing those things in tracks that you love. Now, we have learned so much about forming scales, what notes belong in a scale and how to make chords and chord progressions. Next, I wanna show you how to put that all together in the context of making a track. But before we do that, let me show you something really quick. This is a little bit of a break, obviously, by the way. Um, this is my latest watercolor painting. 
I did it on a bigger canvas than I usually do and I'm pretty proud of it. I can see some mistakes, but I want to get better and better. And I was actually learning watercolor because I wanted to have a creative outlet beyond just music. And I've actually found it really refreshing in terms of creating music, bouncing from one art form to another. And one of the main ways I've been building my skills in watercolor is with Skillshare, the sponsor for today's video. Skillshare is an online learning community for creatives where millions come together to take the next step in their creative journey. They've got thousands of classes, including classes on music theory, uh, music production, business, videography, art, and more. And today, the first 1,000 subscribers to click the link in the description down below will get a one month free trial to Skillshare Premium. And with the Skillshare Premium membership, you have access to all of the classes on Skillshare. So if you want to dive deeper into some of the stuff we're talking about today, they've got a full course on music theory taught within the context of Ableton Live, a DAW that a lot of you producers out there are probably familiar with. And one class that I've also taken that's helped me get my music sounding more professional is the Learn to Mix Your Music class with Young Guru. It's a really good one. I definitely recommend you just check it out. And of course, I already alluded to this, but I've been using it to expand my skill set beyond music. So I've been learning all about watercolor painting. Here's a, a few more of my paintings that I've tried. I've been really into doing the woods, as you can see. I really, really just like doing trees, I guess. Um, but I've been having a lot of fun doing that. I've also created some prints. And there are a few great classes on Skillshare that can help you learn how to watercolor just like that. And if you are also looking for another creative outlet and some of these paintings look cool to you, I've been actually following along with this watercolor class on Skillshare and I've been having a great time doing it. So check out the link in the description, take advantage of the free trial and don't forget that supporting the sponsor means supporting the channel. It's free for you and actually really, really helps the channel out a lot when you all sign up. So check out the link and uh, thank you so much to Skillshare for sponsoring today's video. But for now, let's get back into learning more about music theory. All right, so now I wanna take all of the skills that we already know and put it together in a actual music making context. And we're gonna be doing that within my DAW of choice, Ableton Live. Make no mistake, this is not going to be a music production focused tutorial. This is gonna be strictly about applying the things we learned about music theory to a composition, a piece of music that we're trying to produce. And I find that one of the easiest ways for us to start will likely be a chord progression since we just talked about it anyway. Now I want you to go ahead and pick a key. It can be any key. Since we've been working in D major today, I will go ahead and stay with that. And we're also going to work in a four bar loop, a four uh, bar structure here. So I've already got that laid out in Ableton Live, four bars bracketed like this. We're just going to loop it together. And I'm going to go with a slow tempo of about 80. We're going to make a sort of just basic lo-fi beat here. I've got my metronome running. And what I'm going to do at the very basic level is just create a four chord chord progression. Now, don't forget, a scale has seven notes, so we could essentially build seven chords off of any given key. However, we're just going to pick four for now, and we're going to have each one of them last one bar length. That's four beats. You can see one to two, and then we'll start a new one to three to four. So let's go ahead and just pick four chords. Now, some of the chords that we've learned about are more common than others. Like the one chord, of course, is very common. Two chord, I would say, can be pretty common as well. Four, five, six are common as well in a lot of just conventional pop harmony. Not to say we can't do things like have a little three chord in there. And not to say that, you know, the diminished seventh chord doesn't get used, uh, but we're going to be sticking pretty basic. The other thing to keep in mind is some of these chords resolve to others more easily. For instance, if we want to do a four to five to six chord progression, one of the reasons this six chord is going to easily resolve to the one is because it actually are kind of already shares some notes with the one. And the five chord also will easily resolve to the one. There's a lot of tension there because this leading tone, this half step up to the D is the seventh note of the scale. We hear that tension. So it feels like resolution when we land back on the D. So let's take everything we learned about scales and chords 
and lay down a quick chord progression. So basically we are playing uh, the four chord, then we're gonna play an A in root position, but you notice I have that nine in there, that second note between the third and the root. Then we're gonna play the sixth with an extension on top, and then an inversion of our one chord. We do have a root in the bottom, but we're then playing the five, the seven, and the third in that order. Let's lay that down as our chord progression. Now actually, one thing I decided to do there while recording was just hold a note. So if you take just a little look at this MIDI, and I was um, not holding the notes out completely just to make enough time to get to the next chord. I also may have played a couple little flubbed notes in there, little extra notes in there. But nonetheless, you will notice that when we got to this end chord, the D, which is D F sharp A normally, I omitted the F sharp, but I also held on to this A on top. And anytime we can sort of share notes between chords, it actually has a nice effect. I could probably even continue to hold on to this F sharp in that chord. Let's see what that sounds like, this transition. That actually sounds really nice. So we're able to go from that B minor seven chord and resolve down to a D major seventh right there, the one chord. I'm just extending these out so they're nice in legato, meaning that the end of one note meets the beginning of the next. And we'll have a nice chord progression. Easy, right? So we've got a four chord chord progression. We didn't overthink it. Each chord gets held for four beats. We used inversions, we used extensions, and we also used some common notes between chords, which makes it sound even smoother. To play you that exact same chord progression without any of the fancy stuff we talked about with no inversions and no extensions, here's what it would sound like. Compare that to what we ended up with here. This sounds, in my opinion, way better, way more advanced. Okay, so now, usually we would add something like a bass line, right? Let's add a very basic sub bass. And I'm gonna give you a hint. Our bass line has basically already been written for us. The most basic version of a bass line, you could say. I'm gonna find a simple sub bass from Ableton's operator. Drop this in on this MIDI track. And like I said, it's already been written for us because we already know our chord progression and our bass is actually just gonna follow the root note of the chords. This isn't always true for all music. Sometimes bass lines have a lot of movement. Sometimes bass lines walk. However, if you're just starting and you wanna do a simple bass line, use the root note of your chords. And remember, root notes of the chord might not always align with the bottom note. It does for us in this instance, just be mindful of which chords you used and what is the actual root note. So in our case here, we have G followed by A, B, and D. And I might go down to that D actually. Let's just record that really quick. Same chordal rhythm, four beats each. G, four, five, six. These are the chord numbers, right? One. And what doing a bass line like that will help you with is if you do start using some of these inversions and your root note is not in the bottom of your chord progression, this will actually just help solidify the harmony you are trying to imply. This is another reason why even if I didn't have this chord progression here and I just heard this bass line, based on the relationship between the notes, I could tell that this is a four, five, six, one bass line and maybe that's something we can talk about in a future ear training video how that harmony is basically implied by that bass line now really fast i'm going to speed through this you're going to see this all sped up i'm just going to put a couple quick drum samples in from my haze sample pack 
Um, I do make sample packs, which you can purchase, or there's always one sample pack available to members of the channel for free. So hit that join button if that's interesting to you. Because we're not talking about rhythm, I'm literally just going to add a kick and a snare for demonstration purposes. that pretty unquantized but you can hear that we have a basic backbeat which we can talk more about if we do a rhythm video in the future I'm just gonna bring down the volume of these chords a little bit and a lot of you have been asking about melody which we can absolutely go deeper on in a future video but I'll just give you a quick shortcut um, first of all by the way I'm using Sanjay C's Rhodes if you're interested he has a very good Rhodes sound he sampled his own Rhodes and it sounds really good mm -hmm. as you can all hear I'm just going to add some notes on top, aka a melody. I'll add some reverb to them just to make it a little nicer. Now you already know the notes of the scale, so we could even just experiment with just playing the scale. Now you notice that some of those notes sound better than others and that is because of course our chords are changing and which notes make sense also ultimately changes. Now as you can probably guess, the notes that are contained within the chord that is playing at that moment are a likely safe bet to play. It's not a hard and fast rule, you don't have to strictly play notes that are being played in the chords, but it is a good place to start. What I'm actually going to do is just select a group of notes that I think sound good over the whole thing. And just play those. So you notice I'm basically playing one, two, three, five, seven, and then another root on top. And I'm gonna strictly stay to that collection of notes. And I'm going to progress through them in a way that makes sense. I'm not going to make too many giant leaps. I'm going to use mostly consecutive notes, notes that are right next to each other. Or I'm at least going to lead to a consecutive note. We have a target note of E. We can go from D to F sharp to E. That was our target. It kind of made sense. And I'm just going to avoid any crazy motion and play very simple rhythms with this specific collection of notes. Not brain surgery, it's a very sweet, simple sounding melody. Just take a look at it for a moment for your own examination purposes. Notice a couple things about what you're doing with your melody. Which direction is it going? It's mostly just working its way consecutively up with these notes being consecutive in the scale, um, followed by a small leap here, a big leap here, and then we come back down and we do these kind of like back to consecutive motion here, but we do these kind of working our way down using that target note example that I gave before. And you notice we also alternate the type of motion we have, right? Holding a note, we would call slow motion. Playing faster rhythms, we would obviously call fast motion. And we kind of alternate slow, fast, slow, fast, slow, fast, slow. And then this is kind of somewhere in between for a little something different at the end of the phrase. either the root or the fifth. Those are two very, very safe notes to play. But hold the phone here because we just took everything we knew about scales and chords and we made the four core elements of a track. Well, of course, we made a very simple drum pattern, which we'll touch on if we do a future rhythm video. But the chordal instrument, the bass line, and the melody, once you nail down these elements, you have the backbone of something very interesting. As you start to get more advanced and you feel like you can do more and more, you can do things like create counter melodies. Can we create a call and response with this current melody that we made? 
Can we make a more advanced bass line that walks and moves? Can we make our chord progression even more advanced with added extensions and movement? Of course we can, but I want you to do it and progress in a way that feels natural to you, in a way that doesn't feel like you're sort of just walking through the dark woods, perhaps, just kind of scared of what you'll find. But for sure, go and experiment. But with this basic foundation, you kind of understand the basic rules at this point, and I do highly implore you to go start experimenting, start going a little further out things like that. Now, like I said, this was just a music theory demonstration. I've got a whole series that dives a little bit more into the production side of making a track similar to this vibe. So if you want to check that out, uh, that series is available on the channel as well. But nonetheless, I hope you found this lesson helpful in music theory. We are going to be continuing the series next month. Please, again, let me know in the comments. Should we cover rhythm or ear training next? let me know in a comment. Also, if you have further questions based on today's lesson, let me know that as well. Go back and watch the previous videos. If you're feeling a little bit shaky on some of the basic concepts, there's no shame in pausing and watching these videos or re-watching them just to solidify the foundations in your head. It's better for you to do that than to just watch it once and move on not really fully understanding. Of course, don't forget that supporting the sponsor means supporting the channel. So do take advantage of the free one month of Skillshare Premium down in the description. It really helps the channel out a lot when you all sign up and that enables you to go dive deeper into something like production or music theory or take up a new hobby like watercolor painting, all those things. Please sign up. It's free to sign up. You support the channel. It means a lot to me. Make sure you subscribe to the channel with notifications turned on so you don't miss a future video or a live stream. And I'm looking forward to hearing from you and what you all thought of this music theory lesson. We're going to keep going if you all keep enjoying it. But for now, that's going to be it. Thank you so much for watching. This has been Tatro. Have a good one.